my intention to deceive you in that email. Uh, I went in there this evening and discovered that it was all decorated for what I'm going to call the Last Supper. And uh, you might wonder why I might call it the Last Supper. Well, I went into the sanctuary and there up on the sanctuary on the platform is a hangman's gallow prepared for Mike Sorrell. And so uh, on Friday night, he'll have his Last Supper there in the in the uh, fellowship hall. And I didn't want to mess up all the decorations. Of course, you know, I'm kidding. Mike's getting married and uh, it might be his Last Supper as a single man, though. Bless his heart. And I'm excited for him and, uh, and Megan both. Uh, excited to be a part of that. Hope that you'll be in prayer about it. Uh, we're all very uh, regretful that not everyone can come that wanted to be here because of social distancing and things, but it will be available online. We encourage you to watch. And so uh, just be in prayer about that for them. And so here I am uh, in one of the rooms of the church uh, uh, with a, a nice background behind me and my notes in front of me and prepared to lead you in our study as we continue through Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, just by way of a couple comments, uh, I wanted to thank you all. Uh, even after Sunday morning, uh, there were even more responses to the survey that I sent out regarding our response to COVID-19 and the potentiality of us reopening anytime soon. And so we've got about almost 120. And so I have compiled all that information and kind of devised a starting point of a plan. And I've sent that to the deacons. And we're going to be discussing that uh, on Sunday after church. And so uh, hopefully... Uh, if we can come to an agreement and uh, the Lord just gives us clear guidance as to how we should proceed, uh, perhaps early in the week I'll be able to share with you what the plans are looking like. I would ask that you would be in prayer about that as well. Uh, as you're very, very well, very well aware, uh, this is a very divisive topic. No one is going to be completely satisfied. No one particular person's view is going to be completely met. Uh, and so we want to we do the best for the church, the best for the individuals, and we're doing it very prayerfully and uh, just ask that you would do the same. So uh, with that being said, it's raining outside, but I'm in here. And if you would open up your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I, I went through uh, the first few verses of chapter 5 on Sunday, uh, but I, I went through a lot and I didn't cover it very uh, in much detail. It was a very broad overview of these instructions that Paul has given us. He told us earlier in chapter 4 that he wanted us to put off the old man, all right, the man who lived according to the, the ways of Adam, if you will, as a son of Adam, and put on this new man, uh, the new man who was renewed in his mind. He was transformed, being transformed into the image of Christ, he would say in, in another one of his letters, uh, to put off the old, to put on this new man, which we understand to be the community of, of believers, the body of Christ, if you will and the unity in which we, we share uh, is, is, is one body in Christ. And that's what he asked us to do. Then in verse number 25, through the first few verses of chapter 5, he starts talking about some very concrete things. Again, where, the, where our feet hit the pavement, where the rubber hits the road, on what this new man is to live like and what he's not to live like. Uh, and not in broad generalities, you know, lustfully and things like that, but very concrete things. And so one of those things... Uh, that he mentions that we're going to talk about this week is, is lying or the need. That's in the negative sense. And in the positive sense, he says we have to put forth the truth. Now, as we looked at the, the broad view of all these different things, I want to remind you that the, the purpose of all of them was to pursue unity as, as this new man, this oneness in Christ that we have, to edify or to build up the body. And ultimately, all the things that he tells us to do or to not do, the exhortations and the instructions, all of them stem from who God is, his character, his attributes, not just his will, but even his will would be an extension of his character and his nature and his attributes. And so I mentioned some broad things like, for instance, uh, we don't lie because God is truth. We don't murder because God is life. So those are some, some easy, catchy ways to catch the, the point that I'm trying to make as to why these things are right, why right is right. Right is right because it stems from the nature and the attributes and the character of God, and that's how we get all the things that we have in this life. But let's talk a little bit more specifically about this idea of lying or telling the truth. In verse number 25, Paul says, putting away lying. All right, so there's the expectation that as they have this new man on, this is already something that they're in the process of doing or have already done, that they put away this line. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Now, it'd be impossible for me to 
completely and exhaustively cover the subject of lying or truth telling uh, in such a short period of time as I have this evening. But I want to at least kind of stir your thinking, uh, maybe challenge you. I, I don't know that any of you would call yourselves outright liars, uh, but maybe in some of the things that I, I might discuss uh, this evening, you might be challenged uh, as far as your approach on truth and how we sometimes kind of stretch things a little bit, you know, where we technically didn't lie, but yet at the same time, we certainly withheld the truth from that individual we were talking to. Or maybe even worse, we without lying led them into believing something that was false. And so I think the intent there is still the same. Uh, so I want, at least want to stir this all up. And, and I, want you to, I want you to consider the fact that perhaps no other sin, perhaps no other sin has had such a great impact and been so pervasive uh, in, in our society and in the course of human history. Consider that, now that's, you know, that's subjective on my part, but, but consider the fact that the initial temptation of Eve in the garden was rooted in a lie, okay? It was rooted in a lie. What was that lie? What did the serpent tell her? You won't die. He first, you know, had her had questioned her. Did God really say that? Well, she didn't know for sure because she wasn't there. Her, it was a command given directly to her husband. Uh, but the, the serpent Satan lied to her and said, "You're not going to die if you eat of this fruit." And the result of her believing that lie and being deceived uh, was that uh, the world was infected uh, with this sin that was rooted in the lies of the deceiver himself. Uh, the scripture very clearly says that Satan is the father of all lies, and you know that might. It might not be just that we sometimes think of that father of all lies, meaning that all lies originate from him, and that might be what it means, but it also might just be referring to the fact that because of his initial lie, we ended into a whole history of lies when, when mankind fell. It could be either one. I'm not sure. It's not the point of today. Uh, studies show, interestingly enough, there was a book uh, written not, not I, probably a couple decades ago, uh, and it posited the idea that a full 91% of Americans lie regularly, and most of them see no moral or ethical issue with it at all. 91%. And sadly, you might think, well, you know, we're Christians. We're the, we're the new man. We're the body of Christ. Uh, we're the church of Christ. Surely things would be different. Well, as you're aware, with many, many other areas or categories of sin in, in the lives of believers and non-believers, Sadly, there's not a lot of difference between the churched and the unchurched or the professing or the non-professing believers. 91% uh, of people would engage in lying on, on a weekly basis or a daily basis. Um, consider this, and this is more of an illustration. It's not necessarily anything foundational. Uh, but if you were to go to Harvard University in Harvard Square, I've been there before, but I don't know if I actually saw this particular thing. Uh, but if you went to Harvard University, which initially in the 1600s was established as a seminary for clergy or Bible college, whatever they might want to have called it back then. But if you go there in the midst of Harvard Square, there is a, a large statue of a man seated. Uh, and that statue in the middle of Harvard Square has an insignia on the bottom or a, an inscription on the bottom that says, John Harvard, founder, 1638. John Harvard, founder, 1638. Now this iconic statue is known as the Statue of the Three Lies. The Statue of the Three Lies. First of all, it is not a statue of John Harvard. The guy who, who sculpted the statue, I think it's made of brass, I'm not sure, uh, but the guy who sculpted this didn't have a picture of John Harvard. So he just plucked a, a, a respectable, well-clothed looking guy of the era and sculpted him instead. So that's the first lie. It's not a sculpture of John Harvard. The second lie is the idea that John Harvard was the founder. John Harvard was not a founder of Harvard University. As a matter of fact, when Harvard University first started in 1636, it was known as the New College, and it was specifically put there for Bible instruction for clergy or for seminarians. And that was in 1636, all right? And so uh, it's not a statue of John Harvard. He wasn't a founder. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Harvard wasn't founded in 1638. Uh, it was founded in 1636. 
But the ironic part of all this, in the midst of these three lies, somewhere on the statue, I'm not sure exactly where, on the side or somewhere, is the, the uh, insignia of Harvard University. And in the very center of all that, it has the Latin word veritas, which says truth, truth. So something stamped with an, an insignia that declares truth or the pursuit of truth is stamped on something that is literally a foundation of lies. And I just think that's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, to be true, something has to be in accordance with reality, all right? Uh, it needs to be objective in that sense. And this is what Paul tells us, that we're to speak with one another in the positive sense, all right? In the negative sense, he tells us not to lie or putting away lying, all right? Same thing, not lying. So lying in and of itself or not lying is not sufficient. We've also got to, to adhere to the words of Paul or his instructions, we've also got to speak the truth. And I would add um, uh, that it's gotta be done in love. If you look earlier in chapter four, he talks about this practice of, 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 of our speech being done in love because that's what builds things up. That's what he mentioned earlier in the chapter. Now, it's important to kind of remind ourselves what a lie is because I, I've numerous times and numerous places I've seen people get confused as to what a lie or a liar is. A lie requires knowledge of the truth and it also requires some intentionality of, of deceiving, all right? So if you tell someone something that's wrong and you don't know it to be wrong, you just shared some information. Maybe you got it off the internet or Maybe you remembered it wrongly, so to speak, but you shared that information and it was not correct. You wouldn't be a liar. You'd just be wrong. You'd be misinformed. On the other hand, if you know something to be false, all right, in other words, you know what is actually in accordance with reality and truth, and you intentionally posit an alternate scenario to somebody that is contrary to the truth or reality, then that would be a lie. There's some intentionality there. You know what the truth is and you posit an alternate, uh, uh, an alternate reality or an alternate fact or, or truth, so, supposedly. Now, I hope you all agree that there's a big difference between someone who's just wrong about something or misinformed about something and someone actually being a liar, all right? Now, Scripture has some very, very clear instructions or words uh, about, about those who would lie, all right? In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, listen to what it says. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates, okay? Now, I, I don't want to say this word is prohibited in my house. I don't know that I've ever said that, but I don't like the word hate, all right? It's just something I, I hate. <laughs> I just don't like it. But even here in Scripture, uh, it shows the, just the, the, how abominable the, the, the Lord considers these different things. So it says there's six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him. The first is haughty eyes. The second is a lying tongue. All right, so there's the subject that we're on today. He then says, in hands that shed innocent blood, so that would be murder, uh, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, and here, here it is again, a false witness who breathes out lies and a man who sows discord among brothers. Now, did you notice there? Of course you did. I pointed it out to you. But, but I just want you to notice that among those seven things that the Lord finds an abomination, six that he hates, um, two of them involve us lying or presenting falsehoods that are contrary to in being in accordance with reality, all right? Now, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, and he had a lot to say about lying. He said in chapter 12 that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. So clearly, the Lord is not in favor of falsehood and propagating them intentionally. Uh, in chapter 12, he again says, truthful lips endure forever. Now, consider that in light of what Paul told us to do. He told us to speak truth to one another because we're of, of one body, or of, of one mind, all right? And so truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. In other words, it's temporary, all right? In chapter 20, again, same lines, he says, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, 
but afterward his mouth will be full of gravel, all right? So the immediate satisfaction of the lie is eventually, don't know exactly when, but it's always followed by the ultimate reality, which is foul tasting and gravel in your mouth, really. Uh, and then finally in chapter 21, he says the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor. So it's not that you can't get something. It's not that you can't experience something, but he describes it as treasures, but fleeting like a vapor that just vanishes as it dissipates into the air. And then ultimately he says is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death, a snare of death. Now, here's the question. With such clear guidance that these things are an abomination to God, that he hates lying and, 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 the, and the intent behind lying, and that ultimately it doesn't pay off in the end. I mean, there might be some initial gratification, but in the end it doesn't pay off. I mean, he gives things like death and gravel in your mouth is the final taste of it all. Why would we continue to do it? Why would it be so prevalent in society? Why would 91% of the people uh, admit to doing it on a regular, if not daily basis, and not con considering it to be that big of a deal? Well, there are, I mean, there are an, an infinite number of resources out there, and they, they, they label various reasons for why we lie and, and the, the motivation behind lying. And there's lists as long as 30 different types of lies, down to narrowing it down to two or three or four. I've kind of handpicked some or the broader category. Sometimes they overlap a little bit, and I, I tried to make it creative in the way I've named them, and it'll fall apart at the end. Don't worry about all that. Uh, the, first, the first reason we lie is self-protection, all right? Self-protection. We want to avoid the consequences for our actions, all right? And so this is what your kids do when they get busted, all right, or they're close to getting busted, all right? Now, I remember as a, as a kid, I, I may have shared this story with you before. As a kid, I, I was in the second grade, and that was kind of like my rebellious years, you know. I was, I was eight years old, and I was learning a lot of new words, you know, words that I talked about a couple years ago, and we talked about that in that January series. And these were some really good, interesting words, and, and I really liked to say these words. And uh, I remember one particular day at the end of recess, we were all lining up to go back into the, into the schoolyard at Spring Hill Elementary School and down in Spring Hill, Florida. And little Lisa was sitting in front of me, and I decided to share quite a few of these, these words with Lisa. And Lisa was not as excited about those words as I was, and so she went and told Miss Knight that I had said all these words. And so Miss Knight comes back and she says, Craig, did you say such and such and such and such of these words? And of course, because out of an act of self-protection, wanting to protect my behind, what did I do? I lied. I lied, no, no, why would I say that? I, I didn't say all this. And so I lied and I lied and I lied and I lied my way all the way to the principal's office and finally, the principal lied to me and said, Craig, if you'll just tell me the truth, I won't spank you. And so I believed him. And so I told him, well, yeah, I did say all those things. And I guess technically he didn't lie to me. He let the, the, the that was the vice principal who told me that. And the man who actually spanked me was the actual principal. And that was the last time I went to the office that year because that was exactly what I needed. And they should really bring all that back into schools, but that's a completely different subject. So the first reason we lie is for self-protection. The second possibility is for self-preservation. Now, I know that kind of sounds the same, but it's a little bit different. This is when we try to avoid potential danger, okay? Uh, in other words, in this example, I would think about uh, it was Abraham, who when he was traveling to that particular land, uh, what was it, Egypt, and uh, wherever it was, the famine was there, and he had this beautiful wife, and, and he lied to the king and all of his men and said, she's my sister, okay? So in an act of self-preservation, he was trying to present an alternate reality that would be a little bit safer for him. He hadn't, quote, done anything wrong, you know, that he was trying to avoid the consequences, uh, but he, he presented an alternate reality there to try to have some act of self-preservation. There's another opportunity, and so far these are sounding really good, self-protection, self-preservation. Now we've got self-promotion, all right? You see, this is when we try to elevate ourselves to above our real situation, all right? We're trying to be braggadocious and, and, and just talk about our abilities in an exaggerated way, or maybe even outright lies, all right? 
And so uh, this one, I've never done this before, but you see it everywhere. You hear about it all the time about these dating websites and things like that and the profiles that people put on there. And of course, you know, the vast majority of them are outright lies. The, the pictures that are put on there from 30 years ago when you were 60 pounds, you know, and, and all, you know, less and all this sort of stuff. And, and the, the guy will put on their sensitive athletic male, knowing that he's hard as he could possibly be. He hasn't ran a mile in 10 years. And, uh, and the only thing, well, I won't talk about the manhood part, but anyway, so the, the reality is, is that we sometimes in an act of self-promotion present ourselves in a way that's not in accordance to reality. Maybe we lie or brag about things on our resume that didn't take place. Uh, all, all acts of self-promotion. The next possibility is self-seeking, all right? We're lying to get what we want by an act of deception, okay? Uh, not just to have a higher position, if you will, or view in other people's eyes, but to actually receive something in return. We're trying to get our own, so to speak, or what we feel is our own. A biblical example of this would be Jacob, who lied to his father Isaac to get that birthright. Perfect example. I'm not sure why this particular example came up to me, but the, the, the other one was this, is the idea, I can't remember what they call these guys, but these guys that pose in military fatigues, even sometimes wearing medals and things like that, and go to airports or restaurants uh, to try to get, yes, that, that's also an act of self-promotion. They want the prestige of being a veteran or, or in the military, but all the time they might want something, you know, a free meal or something like that out of it. And so all of these things are self-seeking, self-promotion. Another possibility is self-control. And I don't mean controlling yourself, but I mean you yourself trying to control somebody else. This is when my, my verbiage kind of breaks down a little bit, sorry. So uh, I remember a long, long time ago watching one of those investigative things, ID or whatever on whatever channel. Uh, and this, this gentleman, horrible, horrible man, had, had held this woman captive for 13 years. In the last 10 years of her being held captive in, in his home, she was free to come and go. But in, in an attempt to control her, he had lied to her and told her that all of the neighbors were part of the same secret group. And that if she tried to go beyond the neighborhood boundaries or if she tried to talk with anybody, that everybody was a part of the group and that she would be reported and it would be horrible consequences. So there's a, a situation where you're trying to control, you're trying to deceive, you're trying to manipulate. Now I realize these are things that inside the church are probably not typical, you know, at least the examples I, I've just shared with you. But we, we realize that that's a, one of the things that a, a liar would do to try to manipulate reality in order to, to seek out his own means and ends and to manipulate. Another possibility, and I think this one's pretty common, is self-amusement, all right? And this is the kind of person who throws out a lie to just stir things up. I mean, it's, the, it's that Jerry Springer, I love the drama type mentality that we see in, on TV today and, and it's dis displayed everywhere. And so sometimes people will lie just to throw things out there to stir up the hornet's nest, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of different other reasons. Sometimes people just, they, they want to see their, their ends brought about. All right, again, that's kind of like self-seeking. But sometimes, maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not they're just trying to swindle a new car or get something like that, some material type thing. Maybe, maybe the thing that they want is actually a good thing. But in their mind, this was a common thing that we saw in the mission field where lying didn't quite have the stigma that it had in, in, in other cultures. And so in the mission field, even in the church, if the ultimate end was a good thing, like for instance, if, uh, if, a, if, a, if a missionary came up to a particular ethnic leader, a pastor, and this missionary was, let's just say he was a, he was a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Presbyterian, uh, and this particular pastor realized that this guy wanted to support his ministry in this rural area and they desperately needed money, nothing wrong with having money. Well, it was very, very common for leaders like that to proclaim their fellowships to be of the same denomination as this particular foreign leader in order to get money. And so uh, you'd have leaders getting money from all different types of place, from Presbyterians, from Baptists, from Evangelicals, from Pentecostals and everything. And 
again, the idea was is that the, the means or the ends justify the means, even when the means means lying, okay? Now, of course, uh, sometimes lies aren't necessarily uh, intended to benefit us. Sometimes those lies have the intention of benefiting others, okay? Um, and so you might have someone say, uh, you know, she's not here right now, um, so she can't come to the phone, when in reality the person's just in the other room, okay? It's kind of like a lie of convenience, all right? Uh, or you might have, I remember uh, one of my favorite television shows years ago was Everybody Loves Raymond, and they'd done a flashback episode where it was the time he had first uh, had a dinner with his who would the woman who would one day be his wife and she cooked lemon chicken and she cooked lemon chicken she wasn't a good cook at the time and and uh you know she was whatever and so he, she gives him this lemon chicken and she asked if it was good well he lied to her and he said it was the best thing that he'd ever eaten and he could eat this every day of his life well you know for the rest of his life he ate it every week uh to, to his dismay uh, and so that was a lie of convenience or being polite not wanting to offend somebody uh, you've got the, you know, the, the, your wife ask you, honey, do I look fat in this dress? You know, no, that dress doesn't make you look fat, dear. Or, or here's, here's my favorite as a pastor. I'll see you on Sunday, pastor. And I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to visit people who haven't been to church in months and months or years and years. And, and uh, I'll, I'll get that from them and, and, and then they don't show up. Uh, I don't know if they do that to make me feel good or make me get out the door a little bit easier. I'm not sure. And then there's, of course, there's that, uh, that very, very popular scenario when it comes to, to, to having a debate about lying and the idea that, you know, when the, the Nazi soldiers came to a, a Jewish household or to a household that was harboring Jews, you know, in their attic or in their cellars or whatever, was it a sin to lie? And so there's the idea, no, Mr. Nazi soldier, there are no Jews in our attic, all right? Um, and so there's a lot of different other ones. I, I don't have time to, to go through them all. Um, but what I want you to see is that sometimes we have all different kinds of motivations for lying and, and some of them might even seem to be noble, you know, not wanting to offend somebody, not wanting to let somebody down. Maybe even you lie and take the blame for somebody else's fault and you take the punishment rather than them. A lot of these things seem noble, but let me suggest to you that none of them really are. Uh, at the end of the day, all right? In reality, at the core of every lie is this root. And it's the root that I came to the conclusion uh, on this past Sunday, and it's this. Every lie has the root of a thing that I wanna call idolatry, okay? Idolatry. Now, usually we think of idolatry, you know, you've got the wooden thing and you're worshiping it and things like that, and, and that's certainly a case of it. But idolatry is simply this putting something else in God's position or in a position above God, all right? So, think about it. When you lie, think of some, some of the examples that I mentioned, you know, like when Abraham lied to the, the, the king and when Jacob lied to his father and things like that. Think about those biblical examples or even more. When, when you lie, here's what you do that's idolatrous. Uh, it's, it's one of these or maybe a combination of them but you put your agenda or your will above God's. The situation that God's created for me is not enough. My will is, is higher than God's, so I'm gonna do whatever I've gotta to do to bring about my will, all right? Or we put our judgment above God's, all right? And so here's a situation, it's not one that I mentioned, but this, was the, this is the one that's mentioned in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments don't actually say, Thou shalt not lie. It says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. So there's the idea in a, in a court of testimony that you present the truth and that you would not present a scenario that would convict your, your, your neighbor or, or anybody else in, in an unjust fashion. But quite often, we want to bring out justice in our own way. So when it didn't come out the normal way and we don't like things the, the way we want them, we play judge and jury and through lies and deceit try to bring about our own verdict in the life of somebody else. Again, putting our criteria, our judgment and, and, and mindset above God's. Another possibility is that we put the fear of men above our fear of God, all right? And so I'm more concerned about what this king's going to do. I can't remember what his name was. I don't think it was Abimelech or something. 
But we, we put this king, the fear of this king, above our fear of God. God who thinks that lying is an abomination, and that he hates it. And so, so who are you going to fear? Who's ultimately in control? Are you making your decisions based upon your fear of your parents and they're in a, in a paddle on your butt or uh, the fear of a, of a king or a police officer or whoever it might be? Or is it ultimately God? There's other things, though. We rely on, on the power of self or others above God's, all right? So there's this reliance on, and this is kind of the same idea, whether we're, we're relying on the fear of somebody else and putting that above the fear of God or relying on somebody else's ability or power, lying to manipulate, to get in good with somebody as if they've got more power than God to put you where he wants you ultimately to be, all right? We put our timing above God's timing. This isn't happening fast enough, God. So I'm gonna do what I've gotta to do to speed this process up. I'm gonna lie and make the situation seem more dire to try to get somebody else out here to help me or to speed things along. Or, here's another one, again, not an exhaustive list, but we put our desired image above the image of God that we were created in. In other words, who God made me to be and, and the way he fashioned me and, and instilled his spirit in me and gave me the ability to walk in his image and you in union and oneness with him and other people, not enough. I've got to lie to put myself into a higher position of power or influence or something else. What he has laid out for me isn't enough. All of these things are us putting our desires, our wants, our fears, or whatever it is, above God in, in, in position. And influence in our lives and that is idolatry one theologian put it this way a lie is nothing more than a covering all right now we're going back to the garden I love the garden you know that by now a lie is nothing more than a covering a fig leaf masking your own nakedness I'm afraid of the truth for the truth will only reveal my inability my loneliness my helplessness my lack of patience my shortcomings, my weaknesses. If it's not being good that matters, it's looking good that counts, at least in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the minds of the liar. In the end, he says, I'm more afraid of others than I am of God. All right? And that is idolatry. At the end of the day, it all goes back to doubting God and that was the very thing that Satan got Eve to do in that garden. To doubt that what she heard that God had said, that you'll die if you eat of this fruit. Uh, to doubt that that would be true. Listen, in our society today, we live in a place in a time where with as much advancements as, as we've made, the idea is posited that there is no absolute truth. And so the need for truth in the body of Christ in this new man has never been more important than it is today. I really, really believe that. So, because how can we possibly say that we know, I mean experientially, personally, that we know Christ who claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and yet we walk in a lie? We walk in a false reality or we present a false reality. Earlier, excuse me, earlier I spoke about Harvard. And uh, Harvard went from being a, a place for clergy to come be trained uh, to ultimately being one of the most liberal universities in, in, the, in the world, certainly in America. Um, it's interesting that uh, their very first motto their first insignia. I wish I could show it to you. I guess I could have because I could have held it up to the screen. Um, but it was, a, it was an insignia that had veritas, but it also had, um, which means truth, but inside of it, if you look very closely, there was the Latin word for church and for Christ. And so initially their insignia or their motto is this, truth for Christ and the church. That was their motto, all right? In their, I'll call it their student handbook, if you will. Again, this was in the 1600s. But listen to what their student handbook said. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is 
to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Did you hear that? Christ is the only found, sound foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, did you hear that? Only the Lord giveth wisdom. This is from Harvard's handbook, all right? Let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. In every one of these, all throughout this is scripture being referenced. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein. Sadly, if you look at their insignia today, if you look at their handbook today, there'll be no mention of Christ, no mention of church. Those two Latin words, truth, still remains on the insignia, veritas, and then it's Harvard. But there's no mention of Christ and no mention of his church. The truth that they seek at a university like Harvard or any of the other liberal universities around, the truth that they seek, we affirm, cannot be fully known apart from the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It just can't be known. Oh, you can know things. You can know some truth. You can know some things. You can discover some great things. And science, even liberal science, has done that. But to know the chief ends of all things, to know the beginnings of all things, cannot be known apart from Christ. I cannot stress um, the importance of what Paul tells us here. On the one hand, we're to put aside lying, all right, and accept the reality that God has given us and to rely on him and his power, whatever all that might mean, all right? And also to set forth an agenda of truthfulness as we speak truth to one another again, and I'll talk more about this in the coming weeks, I believe. I'm not sure how it's all gonna pan out for the rest of this, but, but it's imperative that we not just be yielding the sword of truth and not have it wrapped in love for the benefit and the edification of the body of Christ. That is so important to remember that all this has to be done in love. So again, I cannot stress the importance of we as the new man laying aside lying and advancing the truth for the sake of Christ and for the sake of his church. So I hope that was a, an encouraging word to you. If, um, if you felt some conviction there, I assure you that was the spirit of God, not me. I in no way and it was targeting any of you out there. Uh, that's why, the, why I preach the way I do and I teach the way I do through various books of the Bible. Uh, because it's where we are. Uh, there it is, and so that's what I'm teaching about. So please don't take offense, uh, but if in some way you have been pricked, so to speak, uh, I pray that you would just consider the truth and set aside line and, and pursue truth as, as hard as you can. And so as we now move on, I'm going to ask you if you grab your prayer sheets, if you would. I've got mine printed out here, and uh, we've got a couple new ones. And so uh, I'm going uh, to pray for the new request, which will be a little bit shorter this evening. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, as we've done for, I guess, I don't know, four to six weeks now, uh, again, the, the numbers, uh, they, they start back over after number 30. So if your birthday is on the 11th, like mine is, uh, please pray for all the number 11s. There might be two or three. Um, if you're on the first, you might get three or four uh, to, to pray for. But you pray for all the number ones. I'll pray for all the number 11s and according to your birth date. Uh, but we've got quite a few things going on that I want to pray for. Uh, some surgeries that have gone uh, the past couple days and some folks who have been in the hospital. Um, I want to encourage you, <coughs> excuse me, I want to encourage you, it's not on this list per se, but one of the things that has really, really broken my heart in the midst of this whole quarantine situation is we haven't had a lot of people, but we've had quite a few people who have had to send their spouses to the hospital their children to the hospital um, and not been able to go in with them. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, it's difficult for them to learn and to assess the full situation. Uh, it's difficult because you've got a loved one there who's in a hospital room and even being in there with your loved, room, loved one, if you're there for a long period of time, you lose track of day and night and, and it can create a, a very odd sense of reality and, and can, can kind of make healing even more and more difficult. I'm not a doctor or anything like that, but I've, I've heard that from enough of them to believe that that's true. And so we've had a number of people, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, to tell you this, 
Um, but I, I'm going to anyway, and I'll ask for forgiveness later. But Miss Miss Marie Gooch was in the hospital for I believe one night, um, uh, Friday. I think she came home on Saturday. Um, but she had bronchitis. She's still having a very, very difficult time breathing. They've got her on antibiotics, uh, nebulizer, and other things. And so, uh, Miss Marie, if you're listening to this, I, I love you. I had to let your secret out because I, I want everyone praying for you. And uh, Miss uh, Linda Glenn was in the hospital uh, with a blood sugar level that was whew, an absolute miracle that she didn't go into a diabetic coma. And again, it was a situation where John couldn't be there with her. And uh, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. We're very, very thankful that in all cases, these folks are home. Um, with Miss Kim, our, our pianist, um, uh, her father, I believe he's still in the hospital, I haven't heard today, um, but had open heart surgery, was literally near death, and the family wasn't able to come in until that point where he was near death. Glory be to God, praise the Lord, he is turned around for the better uh, and it's looking very very promising for him I, I, the last I heard so I say all that because I want you informed but I also want you to know that those who are going in it's a lot different situation uh, than it normally is and so pray for them and try to encourage them in any way that you can uh, Lisa had uh, surgery um, on her neck and we want to pray for her uh, she's going to be in pain and we pray for a full recovery that that was that went well uh, Ryan, uh, up up in Pennsylvania, uh, had shoulder surgery. Miss Linda's back at home. Uh, Jason, I, I realize I said some last names earlier. I apologize. I was trying to just go by first names. I realize you'll know who they are, and, and strangers on the Internet won't. Um, uh, but Jason, uh, who had, uh, had fallen off the ladder a while back and had some seizures, he's had some more of those. Uh, and so uh, they're trying to do all kinds of scans and things to figure out what's going on with him. So we want to pray for him. And, uh, and the Driggers family. Uh, we want to pray for them because I didn't realize, and I apologize uh, for, for not having this number in my head, but I did not realize it has been 27 days uh, that their little baby's been in the hospital. Now, they are allowed one at a time to have someone there, but it is, you know how it is, it's exhausting being in a hospital. Uh, it's exhausting seeing your, your little man there struggling and not knowing what to do and and, and more and more questions and symptoms and things like that. And so all of these things can be absolutely overwhelming in addition to the fact that we've got situations at home. We've got some of us have kids at home who haven't finished school yet and trying to get them where they've got to go and limitations and it's just can be overwhelming. And so I want to pray for these and just in general for all the needs of this and ask that you would uh, continue to pray for them as well, okay? So would you, right where you are, wherever you might be, bow your head with me, and we'll lift these up in prayer, and then I'll say goodbye and wish you a good night, all right? Father, we're so grateful that even in the most difficult of times, your truth stands tall, and you are love. You care about us so much that you sent your only son uh, to die for us, and if you were willing to do that while we were still sinners, uh, now that we know Christ is our Savior, Oh my goodness, how your, your mercies continue to abound and your grace abounds even more. And Lord, I just ask that in each and every one of these situations, whether it be a healing from a surgery on a neck or a shoulder or getting sugar levels under control or figuring out what's going on in little man's GI tract and whatever else might be calling him, causing him to have GI problems and fevers and uh, whatever these things are, Lord, Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would give the doctors wisdom, give the nurses and the caregivers the sympathy and the understanding that they need to understand what these needs are for this patient who's in there all alone. Be with the spouses and the parents who can't be in the room. Uh, Father, encourage them, strengthen them. Allow the flow of information to be accurate and complete that people might be encouraged and well-informed about how to take care of the situation and pray for the situation. I pray for full and complete healing in all the situations. And Lord, I pray that as we progress through the various phases of this uh, pandemic or whatever we'd like to call it, Lord, I pray that you would allow truth to rise to the top. Uh, Lord, it's not a political statement or anything like that, Lord, uh, but with all the misinformation going around, it is hard to understand what right and wrong is and what the reality is. And so, 
Uh, Father, I pray for the deacons and uh, for that entire meeting on Sunday where we discuss the possibility of some sort of phased approach to reopening Gorman Baptist Church, that your spirit would reign supreme and give us all absolute agreement no matter what that decision might be. And Lord, I pray that the congregation would continue to pray and that we would all be able to rest as one new man, as one body in Christ in the decision that's made as we advance through this whole thing. Lord, we're grateful that we have you to cling to in all this. Lord, I pray that as, as, uh, as we prepare, I was getting ready to say to travel home, but I think I'm the only one that's going to be doing that. Uh, but Lord, when we make it home, I pray that you'd prepare us for a good night's rest. Uh, pray that we would get many, many hours of sleep, many, many hours of rest for every hour of sleep. Uh, that you'd give us strength for tomorrow and that before our feet hit the ground, we would be quick to, to obey, be obedient to your every command, Lord. Order our steps, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just stay informed, and uh, we hope to see you on Sunday. Pray for some good weather. Uh, so far, it's been a blessing on Sundays, and uh, uh, hopefully sometime early next week, I'll have some information to share with you about what the plans are. But until then, uh, we love you, and if you have any needs, don't hesitate to give me a call, okay? Bye-bye.